You want to do it live? <laughs> yeah, let's do it live. All right, let's okay. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to Monroe Live. I'm Antonio DeNano, a senior engineer here at Monroe, and this is Julian Knights, also an engineer, like senior, mid? Yeah, associate. Okay. Um, so we're continuing our EV wall charger teardown, and we're going to review the top Dawn um, EV wall charger. So let's get started. <clears throat> Uh, so we've got everything laid out here. Uh, since we now have uh, two chargers laid out, we wanted the Tesla level two uh, charger to be sort of our baseline. So we're gonna be comparing sort of the overall number of components. Uh, just as a high level overview, uh, this is a plug-in charger. So whereas the Tesla, when we discussed it before, was hardwired into your home's electrical system, this charger uses an additional connector here. This is uh, also known as a NEMA connector. Uh, typically, certain appliances like a uh, dryer, electric dryer, uh, will be plugged into something like this. Uh, this makes the installation a little bit easier because those kinds of outlets are typically in a home or it's not very expensive to have an outlet like that installed. Uh, but we'll go into some of the pros and cons of having a system like that a little bit later. Um, first off, um, Antonio, a little more about just the installation. You've obviously had the Tesla charger installed at your home. Um, what would some of the drawbacks be between something like the Tesla that's hardwired versus something that might plug into like a dryer outlet? So the nice thing of the hardwire system is that your electrical system is designed to handle that load. So it was set up for a 60 amp breaker. So this is able to do 80% of that 48 amp charge. That's a full charge. And there's no worries about uh, electrical fires or melting down plug connectors because everything is rated to be continuously operated at that uh, load. The top Don is a plug charger. Um, if your plug was set up to run a washing machine or a drying machine, those run for an hour, hour and a half max. And if you were to set up a car to run off of that, it'd be running off of a six to eight hour cycle when it's not usually intended to run for that kind of length, length of period, length of time. And Sandy did a video on this a while ago about some of the uh, hazards associated with that. Mm -hmm. um, so it might not be the safest system, but it is, um, it's functional if you do design it mm -hmm. properly or if your electrical and um, electrician installs everything properly. And to your point, not to say that uh, this is an unsafe unit in any way. These, this is a very typical uh, application uh, for outlets like this. Some of the other ones that we'll be taking a look at, in fact, most of them do have this NEMA outlet compatibility. So it's not to say that it's unsafe, uh, but if you wanted to charge at a full 48 amp, uh, you may incur some additional uh, potential hazards, but it wouldn't necessarily guarantee. You need to take precautions to make sure you pick right. out the right um, plug, right. the right connectors, so you don't have anything short out or melt over time. Right. So uh, with that kind of an overview, we wanna go into the actual construction of this uh, and just to give a sort of a high level overview, uh, we've got all of the components laid out here and we really wanted to drive home uh, that if we sort of bisect the table here, every component that we have right here is everything that was inside of the Tesla wall charger. And then if you take a look at here, the entire rest of the table is everything that was inside of the top Don charger. Uh, so just from a, a construction uh, point of view, one thing that uh, Antonio and I noticed uh, right out of the box, no pun intended, was uh, the fact that in terms of integration, Tesla has multiple functions in their housing uh, where you have the <clears throat> PCB assemblies, all of your electronics stored inside of central housing. And in this one injection molded piece, you have uh, an anchor point for storing the uh, actual charge port uh, when it's not in use. And then the uh, curved top of the housing itself allows you to wrap and hang the charge cable around just the one unit. The top Don, uh, by comparison, uh, uses, in addition to its primary housing, a separate unit that's actually comprised of two separate injection molded pieces made of polycarbonate. Uh, this is then hung onto a wall next to your charger, as you can actually see in the manual here you would have that unit stored next to the charge unit and uh, the charge cable would be hung and stored there. So this is additional componentry that Tesla's integrated all into a single piece on theirs. Uh, even just with this component alone, uh, Antonio and I were a little 
uh, surprised, I suppose, to see that they had done this in two separate components, considering it's the same material. And one of the things that we typically look at here at Monroe in terms of lean design principles is, does it have to be a different material? Does it have to be a different part? Could it be integrated? And we believe that something like this, especially looking at Tesla's uh, execution, uh, very well could have been done in a much simpler fashion. Um, Antonio, do you have any comments on what we saw of the construction? Well, we still have the uh, back plate, which was also integrated into the Tesla, mm -hmm. um, the mounting feature onto the back unit. Yep. And we can take a look at that here. I'm glad you brought that up, Antonio. So the entire charge assembly would go together like so with this plastic back plate uh, effectively being where the charger would actually be mounted to the wall. And we can see on the inside, and we know this because of the template for drilling out the holes. There are a series of injection molded features to indicate where you would drill through the injection molded housing to make the holes that would attach this to the wall. So again, integrated into an injection molded component here, nothing additional required with Tesla. However, with the top Don, similar to how we had a separate component for the uh, charge cable storage, there's also this stamped steel bracket that fits to the back of the housing in order to allow this to hang uh, from the wall. So essentially what we have here in this pile of parts between you know this main housing backing, this stamped piece, and then these two injection moldings, these four components are all uh, done with two components with the Tesla charger. So there is a higher level of integration here. Uh, there are more discrete components and that's ultimately going to drive up cost and uh, installing it uh, as the end user, uh, whereas you would just have a single unit to install to the wall. This makes it a lot more complicated and I don't believe, um, granted this is a little more straightforward, but there's nothing I believe that was included with the top down charger for helping uh, map out where any of your drilling uh, no, it did come spots. Top it, it did, okay. Um, I think the big difference is it's, this is not intended to be opened, where it's, you just plug it in, you hook it to the mount, and then it should be done. Whereas the Tesla is does need to be opened once to be installed. Um, but that's about the only difference. Right. Um, so then, uh, again, in terms of the construction, we did discuss uh, the seal that was uh, located on a couple of the components for the Tesla. Uh, it was the closed cell uh, urethane that was applied. The top don features uh, seals in similar locations. One of them was around the main face plate at the interface between the main housing and the face plate. Uh, and it was actually, and you can see it in place here on the rear where your line one, line two, and ground connections would be. Uh, this is, uh, again, it's a liquid applied. It's different than what we saw on the Tesla where it's uh, very elastic, uh, whereas the urethane on the Tesla would not be. And uh, one thing that we noticed, as you can see, just by the fact that it came apart in pieces, is in removing it from the channel on the main housing, this actually did snap apart. I would be very interested to see how this would hold up over time, just given the fact that it can pull apart fairly easily, and it overall doesn't feel like as robust of a seal. Um, but again, the, how well this uh, would function would be a um, function of the environment that it's in, temperature, sure. moisture, those kinds of things. All right. All right. Um... So the button. Yeah, um, Antonio, do you wanna go into it? Cause I know the previous Tesla, it wasn't exactly the same. Um, yeah, they had a reset button. This, I think this is a emergency stop button. Um, we, I tried to remove it. I didn't have any pliers that fit in there easily. So mm -hmm. on an assembly end, this is a difficult thing to install. Um, which is kind of gonna be the running trend for the rest of this video. Mm -hmm. And to that point, I think, um, Antonio, if you want to lead us into uh, some of the electrical uh, components, and then we can move right. from there onto the charge cable. So when we get to the board, we have some similar features between this board and the Tesla board. So this unit is a surge protection unit. This is for surge. This is a power distribu distribution unit, and this is a DC to DC converter. Um, what, else they, what else they have in common is the Wi-Fi unit and a main control chip mm -hmm. so but the big difference between this one is this is a separate assembly this little unit here is a separate assembly uh, these guys are a lot larger than the Tesla unit so if I put them side by side you can see this 
So the Tesla surge protection unit is these small resistors and those. And then the power distribution unit with the transformer is right next to it, also much smaller in size. Uh, and also the main control chip is even smaller. Tesla is a higher tech company than the company that designed this. Everything's more integrated, it's more thought out, and the circuitry is much tighter. So that's gonna save a lot in the assembly process. And a lot of this also looks to be manual. You see some of the solder um, right where these connectors go to the other side is very thick and gooey. And you also have this large bit on the back end, which is also likely a manual process. Um, so yet again, assembly becoming a trend with this one. And yeah, so to build off of what Antonio had just said, uh, we did discuss uh, this board with our electrical team at length uh, to see what their impressions were. Uh, right off of the bat, so some of the things that uh, we can point to as direct comparisons is uh, we have a uh, light uh, PCB here. Uh, that is very similar to what we have powering the light indicator in the Tesla, which is integrated with this flex cable assembly. And I just visibly looking at the two components together with this ribbon cable that has the integrated ferrite around it. Um, there, it's more off the shelf. It's a you know more standard uh, flat cable as opposed to something that would be printed custom. To Antonio's point, Tesla is uh, more of a high tech company, so to speak whereas uh, this charger was built up with more seemingly off-the-shelf components. It is very visibly um, a little, uh, I don't want to say out of date, but a little more old-fashioned by comparison. A lot of these boards are off-the-shelf, that's why, whereas Tesla would have uh, fewer overall boards, we see that the Wi-Fi card is stacked and soldered directly onto the main PCBA. Uh, we have uh, various components, um, uh, here we have some screw terminals on the board. Uh, we typically see these in more traditional industrial electronic applications as opposed to commercial products. So if we can get a close-up on this, you see right here there's the PB with the uh, slash through it. So that is an indicator that none of the solder in the board contains any lead. There is no such marking anywhere on any of these boards, and we did take our XRF gun to the solder. And Antonio, we did confirm that the solder does have a portion some level of lead content, correct? Correct, this is a leaded solder. Right, so um, in addition to that, there is also typically a marking of uh, ROHS, which is a European Union standard that stands for restrict, uh, Restriction of Hazardous Substances. Uh, so that could be anything, Antonio, I believe, things like uh, we discussed antimony or uh, what would some yeah, others be? Arsenic, uh, you could get some, uh, some of the transition elements. Mm -hmm. um, the semi-metalloids will be used in solders because they're softer. Mm -hmm. um, zinc, but that's not really a heavy metal, right. something along that lines. So typically what we would see is an indicator that it's uh, a uh, safer product or it meets more specifications uh, with regard to uh, material safety. We don't see any of those markings here, and there's very likely a cost reason for that. These are off-the-shelf components. Um, I believe these are sourced from China. Uh, from what our electrical team was able to identify. And there are a number of other cost reduction measures in here as well. Uh, there is one specific component, uh, which we can see right here above the PE. Uh, this is uh, where a uh, GDT or a glass discharge tube would be located. And typically, uh, from my understanding in electronic applications, that's for uh, you know, lightning surge protection, uh, it'll absorb and dissipate energy. And what they've done is they've actually removed the glass discharge tube from this section on the board and just soldered a wire in between it to maintain circuit continuity, but omit a component to uh, drive down the cost of the board. Uh, so there's a number of cost reduction measures in here, uh, in addition to the fact that there seems to be uh, potentially suboptimal uh, material choice um, cost-wise. I'm sure there's a benefit to that. And that's not that this, uh, to Antonio's point, to install this, you don't need to open up the unit. You don't really need to be exposed to the board. Right. So the only person really at risk would be the operator uh, soldering uh, and doing any kind of manual work with this board. Right. But to the end user, you're really not going to see or be exposed to any of that. Uh, it's just interesting because we typically do see that the, the boards are lead-free and ROHS compliant. Right. And this is, so as you were saying, these components are all cheaper, but where they end up adding the cost is in the assembly. Mm -hmm. So while I could put this board together super quick, 
drop this in, drop this in, drop that in, and it's basically assembled. It would probably take us 15 to 20 minutes just to yeah. get the ferrite through one of these mm -hmm. holes to get a cable in. And I, yeah, I believe we'll be able to play some B-roll over this, but uh, to just sort of illustrate what Antonio's uh, speaking to right now is to feed the charge cable itself into the main housing. Um, again, we have a separate cable here that's for the NEMA outlet, uh, but you can see that on top of the cables, uh, there are the uh, ferrite cores, and these need to be fed through the holes in the base of the housing itself. And you can see that just in terms of diameter, the hole is sufficiently large to fit the ferrites through while they're attached to the cable. The only problem comes in that directly inside, and you can even see it just looking head on, is there's a wall blocking a completely straight uh, fit through that hole uh, because there is a uh, clamp for uh, strain relief on those lines that gets attached here. So because of an injection molded feature in the housing, we then lose uh, about, I would say, a third of our clearance through that hole, which makes it incredibly difficult, to, at least for disassembly, to get these ferrites out. And I'm assuming it would be just as difficult during uh, assembly itself. So from fishing this out, uh, it was incredibly difficult. I think, Antonio, this took well over five minutes to fully get the cables out. Five minutes of frustration, yes. Um, whereas with Tesla, it was just a matter of fitting these four lines in through the hole. Uh, and then uh, there was an additional strain relief. But what we can I see here as well is uh, Tesla has a similar strain relief just on the inside of where their seal is uh, to help anchor that cable. But what we see is when we look directly on, they don't have anything blocking that hole. You can see clear through. So there's nothing impeding the ability to feed those cables in. Uh, whereas the top-down charger, there wasn't... Um, a design consideration like that, and that ultimately results in um, increased assembly time, which is then going to drive the assembly cost up due to the inability for an operator to be able to, quick to quickly and effectively uh, get the components where they need to be. The top don, electronics weighed in at 0.42, so it is a little bit lighter than the Tesla because of all the integrated ferrites into the board. Right. Um, the housing is a bit lighter as well because it doesn't have a heavy glass uh, faceplate. So 1.59 kilograms there. The cable is a bit heavier because it is a thicker cable. Um, and overall, it is about a kilogram, half a kilogram heavier. Yeah, I think, uh, Antonio, unless there's anything else to include here, I think that just about wraps it up for the Top Don charger. Uh, stay tuned. We will be doing, uh, I believe, the Grizzly is going to be the next one that we're going to be looking into. Yeah, I think that was the next one. Yeah, I believe it was the Grizzly. Um, yep, so we'll be coming back. So we've got the Grizzly next, and then a series of, I'd say, about six more after that. So uh, we'll uh, be back here tearing things down, and uh, hopefully we'll see you then. Thank you. Right. Thanks.